Well, let's get to it today. Um, how many of you have ever seen like those books for dummies? You know, like whatever for dummies, you know, it could be anything. Uh, so today's message is going to sort of kind of be like that. It's going to be a guide to what we're going to look at today is basically how to live a truly successful life. Now, success or a successful life can look like a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and so that's why the word truly is very important there. We're going to look today uh, in Psalm 128 about how to live a truly successful life. It spells it out for us in six short verses. So we're in this series called Pilgrim Songs, and we're looking at these psalms between 120 and 134 called the Songs of Ascent. So these 15 songs would be sung a couple times a year, two or three times a year, as the Jewish people would would pilgrimage to Jerusalem, their capital city, for holy feasts and festivals. And so as they would go, they would sing these 15 songs kind of on their journey. And we've discussed two of them so far, the first two, in fact. And today we're going to look at one kind of in the middle. And again, see this song of blessing, this song of hope, and again, a roadmap or kind of a how-to manual to live a truly successful life, what that looks like and how we can find it, and really what that means for us. So we're going to read it together, and then like we did the last couple weeks, we'll work through it sort of verse by verse and look at how we can have this kind of life. So Psalm 128, starting at verse number 1, says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And so this verse, or I'm sorry, this psalm is seen sort of what we call as a wisdom psalm. It's interesting how these two sorts of literature don't usually go together, but most scholars would say in this case, this is one of about half a dozen or so wisdom psalms. And that's why, again, it is just sort of a song of blessing, but it does give a roadmap. It does give sort of a how-to to to get these kind of blessings that the psalmist is telling us about. And really, it comes in the first verse. So we're going to really see... What we're going to do is look at really two steps to get this successful life and then the five benefits of that kind of life. So we're going to have the, this kind of flow today um, in this uh, sermon. So it's a wisdom psalm, which is interesting because uh, wisdom, we'll talk about actually a proverb here in just a second. Uh, but the first verse here talks about fearing God which is a very wisdom literature kind of thing to say, fear God. Now, What we think about that phrase, fear God, is important, and how we view that phrase is important. Uh, Pastor and author A.W. Tozer said this. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I would say also, on a a side note, if you've not read anything by him, you should find something. He's a great writer, great thinker, and it, it will really bless you to read stuff from him. But he says that what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And that's true with this idea of fearing God. How we view this, how we treat it, how we look at it really reveals a lot about us one way or another. So the question is, does that mean that I'm to be afraid of God? Not really. I did, I did read something, and there was another uh, resource I looked at this week, and it was basically saying, unless you have a reason to be, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. If you have a reason to be afraid of God, yeah, maybe you should, but it was sort of tongue-in-cheek. So it's not, this idea is not that we're to be afraid of God. Now, you do see this sort of in the Old Testament a little bit, where people are a bit standoffish. Even when the the children of Israel are camped under the mountain of God after they're released from Egyptian bondage, they see the top of the mountain where they think God lives is like on fire. And then when Moses goes and talks to God, he comes back down, his hair is, is white, and his face is shining so brightly they can't even look at him. So they have this fear of God almost to the point of true fear. But really this idea of fear is reverence, of honor, of putting God in highest esteem, placing him number one over everything and everyone else. That's what the true fear of God really is. And it's also this word awe, 
A W E, not like aw, you know. God's so cute, aw. It's not that, okay? It's like aw, like fire on the mountain, face glowing when I see God, kind of aw. And it's this word awesome, which I will admit I overuse probably, okay? Everything's awesome. That's awesome. That's the most awesome thing. But this is like the most, most awesome is how we should view God. And it is for a couple of reasons, uh, or for a few reasons. He is holy. He is perfect. He is mighty. He is powerful. So there is awe there. He's bigger than me. He's mightier than me. He's more important than me or anything else that concerns me. But that can lead to fear in an unhealthy sort of way if we take that to the extreme. Because also what God is, he's our source of power. He's our source of joy. First John says God is love. Not that he loves, which he does, but he is love. It's who he is. It's an attribute of his character. And so those things are like, oh, yeah, I can, I can be in awe of that too without being afraid of him. So we put all this together, and that's what it means to fear God, putting him first, having him in highest esteem. The question is, though, why is this such a big deal? Why is it so important? What's the value to that? And we'll get to specifics in this psalm in a second. But generally, with the idea of fearing God, we look to Proverbs, the wisdom literature, and we see this. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That right there is enough reason to fear God. Because when I put him first... When I look to him for guidance and direction, he gives it. When I'm at a roadblock, but I'm putting him in highest esteem and I'm in awe of him, he's going to guide my path. He's going to give me direction. He's going to give me supernatural insight at times when I'm totally stumped, when I'm totally stuck and don't know what to do, what step to take, what words to say. to say. Like, I feel like I should do something. God, would you help me? If we are, if we are living in, the, in and under the fear of God, he will reveal those things to us. He will give that knowledge and that wisdom that we need for our lives. And I think we all want that. So then it, it, it's on us to live in and under the fear of God. Not to be afraid of him, but to have that awe of him. To seek him first and put him first in all that we do. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And it leads, as we'll see, to this truly successful life. The other thing that verse 1 says is not just that we fear God, but it's closely related, but it says that we would follow his ways, that we fear God and follow his ways. And when I read that this week, I thought about the Terminator. He says, come with me if you want to live, you know. I thought that's kind of what God does. That's a description of God's invitation. Follow me if you want to live. If you want a truly successful life, follow God's ways. But again, like fearing God, it helps to understand that's a pretty loaded statement because there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of rules. If you've seen the Bible, it's pretty thick. If you've seen the Old Testament law, that's pretty thick. So it's like, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to follow God's ways? And it brings us sort of back to the, this Psalm in 128, brings us back to the very first Psalm. Let's look at the beginning of that one just for a second. Psalm 1, starting at verse number 1, says, Blessed is the one, so it starts with the same word as Psalm 128, blessed. It's giving us a road map for this kind of life. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Here's the payoff, verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. And we'll see very similar imagery later on in this psalm that we're talking about, one Psalm 128, this idea of life and growth uh, and even sort of fruit and plants, that sort of thing. We'll see it here specifically in this psalm today. Now notice, we're talking about following God's ways and his laws and his rules and his statutes and his precepts, whatever word you want to use that describes his way. But it's not just about following the rules. Because there's a key word here. It says, their delight is in the law of the Lord. For a Christ follower, there should be joy in following Jesus. There should be joy in following God's ways. And let me just give, say this. If, if, it's not, if that's not describing your walk with Jesus, you might not be doing it right, 
okay? If it's a drudgery to you, you might want to reevaluate how you're doing that. You, if, if it's like, oh, I just don't want to do that, and it's just not, it's a chore, it's a bore, it's, I don't want to do this, but I feel like I have to, you may be doing it wrong. You may have to recalibrate a bit because he says we should find delight in the law of the Lord. We should find joy in serving Jesus. His way should bring us joy. And it can, and that's what the point is. It gives us a life of delight, a life of joy, a life of peace. But as we saw at the beginning of Psalm chapter 1 here, following God's ways looks different than the way that a lot of people live their life. There is a difference there. Following God's way is going to look a bit different because he says we don't want to walk in step with the wicked. We don't want to stand in the way of sinners. We don't want to sit in the company of mockers. So our life as followers of Jesus, following God's ways, will look different than the way that other people live. But again, we're not talking about how to live a normal life. We're talking about how to live a, a, a truly different kind of life, a truly successful life. So if we want to look different than the way most people in their lives and their mess looks, we probably have to approach it in a different way. And that comes again then to Jesus. He says the same thing because he says the two greatest commandments I have for you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's not how most of the world lives. Normally, it's I love me. Number two is I love me some more. Number three is I still like me quite a bit. And then number four may be, may be God or others, but it's way down the list. Jesus flips the script that is normal for most people and says, nope, if you want different results for your life, if you want a truly successful life, you've got to approach it differently. You've got to follow a different path, a different way. It's following God's ways. So fearing God and following God's ways are important. And now let's look in at the rest of this psalm, Psalm 128, and look at these five benefits. There are five key benefits listed here in this psalm that if we fear God and follow his ways, we can experience in our lives. Five levels of success, if you will. And we're going to look at them sort of from in, inward to outward, smallest to largest as we go, okay? So the first kind of level of benefit or the first benefit to this life of true success is what I would call inner success. Verse 2 says, you shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. We've kind of, I'll, I'll be quick on this point because we kind of already covered that in the fearing God point here. The initial uh, benefit of fearing God and following his ways is that I have this inner peace that I've always longed for. I have answers to these big life questions that I've always wondered. Whoa, what's, the pur what's my purpose? What's my meaning? What's my mission? What's God's plan? We find that as we fear God and follow his ways, we find inner success. We find direction, purpose, peace, fulfillment. And again, what that does, Paul says in Romans 12 that we recal God recalibrates our thinking as we fear him and follow his ways to then fear him and follow him even more. Romans 12, 2, Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Again, you got to look different. You got to live different. It's got to be a different way. You're going to get the same results as everybody else that's messed up, everybody else that's lost, everybody else that's questioning and worried and stressed out. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So it's a cycle that is strengthened. That's what this inner success is. So as I take a chance on God and say, okay, I don't know about all this faith stuff, and I'm not totally convinced, but I'm going to choose to fear you, put you first. I'm going to choose to follow your way. That might be different than what I would choose and different than what most people choose, okay? As we do that, God then continues to reveal more about himself to us, more of himself to us, which in turn strengthens our fear of him and, and strengthens our following of his ways. And then guess what? As we do that even deeper, then he continues to reconform our minds, and it's just a cycle that strengthens us in our faith. It's this inner success. I find more peace the more that I fear God and follow his ways. The deeper I dig into him, the, the more peace I have, the more direction I have, the more fulfillment I experience in myself, not in myself, but myself through him, through seeking him, fearing him, following him. We can experience hope, peace, direction as we fear God and follow his ways. We can find that inner success. 
The second level of success that we find in this kind of life of fearing God and following his ways is what I call personal success. The first part of verse 2 says, you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. So what we see here is really professional success. And even to some degree here, financial success. Now, I'm not saying if you follow God, you're going to be rich. It's not what I'm talking about. But he says you're going to eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands. You're, going to, you're not just going to work and work and work and then, oh, it's because even Solomon in some of his writings says everything's meaningless. We work and work and toil and toil and we just still feel terrible. Well, that doesn't sound like to me like a guy who's really fearing God and following his ways very closely at that time in his life. Or he's describing someone who's not living that way. So he's saying you're going to enjoy what you do. You're going to enjoy your labor. You're going to enjoy the fruit of your labor because, get this, you're not just working at your job, but you're working with purpose, a deeper purpose. This inner success then, again, kind of ripples out into other areas of your life. So then you find true purpose at your job, and you can enjoy what you do. You may hate what you do, but you might, you're going to enjoy going to work because you've found purpose in that. you found direction in that. you found peace in that. And it also comes down to we learn to live in balance. This, this personal success, if we fear God, follow his ways, it creates balance because we're seeing things God's way, and we're doing them his way. And again, Jesus echoes this in Matthew, Matthew 6, 33. Jesus says, seek first... So we're fearing God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be, added, will be given to you as well. Because he's talking about you work and you worry and you don't know if you're going to have enough and you're afraid. And he says, hey, here's the deal. If you want this personal success in this area of your life, seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. You can enjoy provision because you're seeking it in God, not in yourself. Not in more money or stuff or wealth or possessions. You're seeking it in him. You can, you can enjoy your wealth more because you seek God first, so sometimes you're okay with less. Sometimes that's as simple as that. As I seek him more, I don't need as much, so I find contentment automatically. I find this personal success like a knee-jerk reaction because I'm seeking him, not everything else. Not the peripheral stuff. Not this extra, these things that are temporary. They're going to fade anyway. And then Paul in 2 Corinthians writes something that, again, this is going back to, I'm connecting a lot of dots here. I forgot to warn you, we're going to a lot of scripture today, but you, you're just, we're already in it, so it's too late to leave now, all right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 and 11, Paul says this, it's the same kind of thing about this sort of uh, financial sort of life, the, the stuff sort of part of your life. He says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So he says, God's going to provide. Stop worrying. Stop asking if he will. Just believe that he will. And then he says, here's the point of his provision for us. Okay, here's the point. Here's how we live differently than everybody else. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The context of this scripture is Paul's talking about giving. So this is not a sermon on giving. Okay, did that a while ago. I'm not going to do it again. But that is the context of what he's saying. So he's saying here, God will provide for you. But if you want a truly successful life, unlike 90% of everybody around you, you have to see your stuff and your wealth the way that God sees it and the way he designed it, which is to be generous with it. Now, does God know what you need? Yes, but he's already said he's going to supply, so don't worry. But when he does supply and even supplies more than you need, that's because he wants you to be generous with it. He wants you to give. Even verse 7 is one of the most famous verses on giving. God loves a cheerful giver. And again, there is a cycle to this as well. I believe the more that we are generous, the more God can trust us with more. Okay? So, and again, I'm not saying... Oh, I, no, I won't say it, even as a joke, because that's not appropriate. I was going to say, if you just give a huge offering, you know, just see what God will do. Maybe he will, and I don't want to do that, all right? I don't have enough product in my hair um, to make that kind of claim. But I do believe that if we, again, if we fear God and follow his ways, if we seek him, he'll provide. And if we're going to be generous, I don't think God's going to mind adding a little bit on top. I mean, because he knows what you're going to be generous with. It. You're going to use it the way he wants you to use it. So it's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's not a pyramid scheme. I'm not going to have you sign. I don't need you to sign up three of your friends for this plan. Uh, but I just believe that's the way God works. He works differently, and if we follow him, we'll have those kind of different sort of results in our life, that personal success. Here's the third level of success that we can see from Psalm 128, and that is 
family success. Uh, The psalm says, your wife will be like the fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Now, I'm not going to get into this gender stuff. It is talking about a man. We're not going to talk about any of that. We're just going to, that's what what they're doing here is what he's doing here. So, uh, but here's the thing. If we fear God and follow his ways, we're going to lead our families well. I didn't say perfect. I didn't say parents aren't going to make mistakes. I didn't say kids aren't going to still rebel. I'm saying if we fear God and follow his ways, we're going to have this kind of family success. It will be part of this truly phenomenally different kind of successful life. We can lead our families well. He talks about the vine and olives. So wine and olives, they are staples in this Mediterranean diet. People that read this are like, oh, yeah, we got a bunch of that. We're good. Life is good. We're full of joy. They're full of provision. You know, things are great if we have these two elements. So the, the original reader would see that right away. But then also, we'll go back to Paul again. He echoes a lot of what this psalmist says indirectly. There's a lot of connections here. So Paul says the same kind of thing. And we, I'll just reference it, but it's the end of Ephesians 5 and the beginning of Ephesians 6 because he's giving instructions on how family structures should look for a Christian. For a Christ-filled household, here's how it should look. And this is not, again, this is not popular in today's culture. It's not common in today's culture, and that's why we have the issues that we have because there's been a huge breakdown in the family system because by and large, we're not fearing God or following his ways as a culture. So if we do, we're going to have this success by and large. Here's what Paul says. So at the end of Ephesians 5, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Men, that was your opportunity to shout me down. No one took it. All right. He says, but I know why, because just like you fear God, you also fear your wife. I get it. I understand. He says, Wives, submit to your husbands. And this is not popular, and it does sound very chauvinistic, but that's just what Paul says. I'm not going to argue with God, okay? It doesn't work. Uh, That's like the one time where God can probably say, because I said so. You know, he does that. but. Uh, But then, here's the thing, though. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? Died for it, right? So, husbands... I mean, if you're going to really lay on the tracks for your wife, she will probably submit to you, right? If we can do this God's way, we're going to find this family success. If, if my wife knows that I would literally do anything for her, that instills trust in her. It instills confidence, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm just making sure. All right. If, if Husbands, if we live in such a way that it instills that confidence in our wife, she's going to be confident. She's going to, then, now that she maybe is not going to say submit, but that's what we're looking at here. If we live this kind of way, we're going to get these kind of results. Then in chapter six, it says, children, obey your parents. Mm. You hear that down there, kids? Yeah. Uh, children, obey your parents, right? And they also, now here's the thing, like they have a promise with that. They get to live a long life. That's what, you know, it says. It has a promise of long life. But then it also says, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger after that. So, again, if we love our spouses in, under the fear of God in his ways, and as we parent our children in the fear of God and under God's ways, and maybe sometimes instill the fear of God in our kids, okay, uh, then we can find that we'll have this kind of family success. It can lead to a happy home. It can lead to a peaceful home. It can lead to a place full of harmony and joy in our home. We can sit around the table and enjoy it. And I'd be like, oh, please, can, I just need more space. I need more me time. It's like, that's all you have is me time. I know, I just need all of it. So that's the way a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of families that don't fear God and follow his ways, that, that's their life. There's not harmony in the home, and there's, not, there, there's division in the home, and there's arguing, and there's, you know, all kinds of sort of problems. And so here's what I'm saying. If we can learn to live this kind of way in our family, we can see more of this kind of success. Again, this doesn't mean your family is going to be perfect. It doesn't mean your kids are never going to talk back. It doesn't mean you're never going to fight with your, with your spouse. That's not what I'm saying. But if we can adopt these principles on a regular basis, we'll see more of this in this area of our life as well. The fourth level of success is kind of, again, broadening this out. As more and more families can do this and see this kind of harmony and joy and peace and love, it'll spread to neighborhoods and it'll spread to different parts of, different parts of the city. And then eventually what we see here in this psalm is that it can lead to what I would call national success. 
Okay, so it says, the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. That's verse 5. Let me reference another psalm. Psalm 144, 15 echoes the same type of idea. It says, blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. So he's echoing the same thing in Psalm 144 that the psalmist in 128 is saying. That as a group of people fear the Lord and follow his ways, they can find blessing in that group. And it applies to nations. It applies to cities. It applies to, it can apply to the world. Like if we would truly fear God and follow his ways, we can find and experience more of God's blessing. He talks about, you know, the Lord bless you from Zion. That's kind of the mountain of God where God, in, you know, sort of lives is what is, is their idea of that. He blesses us from there and then he makes Jerusalem to prosper. Now Jerusalem, again, Israel is, a ver- is very much a, um, they're not just sort of a, a nation. They're a people group and it's, it's around religion. It's around spirituality, which is different than where we live. I get that. We're in a very segregated sort of society. There's little pockets of people from all over the place, and we have hundreds of millions of people in this country, so I know it, it, it's harder maybe in this kind of climate and culture and size and, and space to do that. But it's still tr- it still is true at, that as a people, as even a nation, if we fear God and follow his ways, we can experience God's blessing. The problem is we don't see that a lot in this country, unfortunately. We've talked about that a couple weeks ago. And then the question might be, well, then, I mean, we're kind of down the tracks here in America, like in the way wrong direction. Is there, is it too late to correct course? Is there any hope? Are we beyond hope? And we find an answer in in a way in 2 Chronicles 7.14. Again, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, but let's look at it again today. It says, if my people, this is God speaking, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. Now, what's interesting, though, is that God says, if my people will do this first. That's the key here. Because not only does a lot of culture, apart from Christ, they don't live this kind of way. Honestly, a lot of church-going Christian people don't either. And even First Peter, in his letter, he says judgment begins in the house of God. So here's the thing. This kind of national success that we want to see that requires us fearing God and following his ways starts with us. It starts with this group here. If we can learn to do that a little bit better, it, people will take notice of that. And that's where really you see the greatest revivals in anywhere is in countries where the gospel is suppressed, it is illegal, and those people, they look different, they live different, they get ratted out. That's where it happens because there's such a distinction there from the way they really live, not just that they profess, not that they have this, well, yeah, I guess if I had to check a box on this survey, yeah, I'm a Christian. That's what a lot of people do. It's like, nope, if we can if we can do what it says here in 2 Chronicles, if we can turn from our wicked ways and, and fear God and follow his way, it's going to have a ripple effect. That's why the way that you live out your faith is so important. That's why the manner in which you live your life is so important. It affects other people and their perception of your faith, whether or not it's genuine or strong or real. It affects other people around you. It's, it's sort of this advertisement for Jesus. So it's upon us then as the church to live this way, not just talk about it, not just talk a good game, but to live it out. So then other people around us can say, I want in on that kind of life that you have. I want that successful life that you have. Well, fear God and follow his ways. Boom. We can have that kind of effect that can spread even to other parts of this country. It can have a huge growing impact. The more our nation begins to fear God and follow his ways, the more he will bless us and we can have this national success. There's a fifth and final element that is bigger than nations, bigger than countries, bigger than continents. And that is, we see here at the end of this psalm, verse 6, generational success. So again, it starts with me having direction and purpose, and then the stuff that I touch directly in my life is changed and affected for the positive. And then my family around me is affected positively by this successful life as I fear and follow God. As our families do this and these families and these families and our churches and our faith communities do that, it spreads and then it can last from generation to generation. The psalmist says in verse 6, may you see your children's children, peace be upon Israel. So there is literally there this hope for a long fruitful life. You'll see your children. That's a literal statement there. The hope of the blessing here of living this kind of life is a long, fruitful life to see in your old age your children's children. 
But then the psalm ends with this kind of open-ended blessing, this, this sort of like, even though there is an exclamation mark here, it's almost like it's just a nothing at the end. Because it's, it's a blessing that continues on and on and on. And it goes back to Abraham. God's covenant with Abraham is, hey, I'm going to make you a mighty nation, which is Israel, and it's, it's going to bless all the families on the earth, God says, will be blessed through you, through this nation that became Israel. And so it didn't just stop with him. It went to his kids. It didn't just stop with them. It went to their kids and on and on. This is like hundreds of years after Abraham. This blessing is still going on generationally. And the promise, the hope of this blessing continuing on as the people fear God and follow his ways is that it will continue on and on after me. That's the hope here is that we can see this lived out in our own lives. One more scripture. This is the last one, I promise, as we close it up. Luke 1, verse 50 says this, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, it's interesting where this comes from. Luke chapter 1, this part of Luke chapter, Luke chapter 1 is where the beginning of the birth story of Jesus is started, okay? And this part is after Mary hears about she's going to give birth to the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah. She sings this song. This is her praise song. And in that, she kind of goes almost back in her mind, I think, to Abraham's promise, She's like, hey, what is about to happen through little old me, little old teenage girl Mary, is fulfillment of this promise. From generation to generation, he's showing his mercy. So it doesn't just stop at one point. It didn't stop with Jesus. It continues on. It shouldn't stop with us. It should continue on. It shouldn't just stop even with our nation. It should just continue on forever and ever and ever. We can have this kind of generational success as we live this out in our lives and in our families and in our nation. So again, as we see these five uh, levels of success, we see how they kind of go together. Okay, so the success that you can experience in your life by fearing God and following his ways not only impact you, but your family and generations to come because you found inner success and personal success that direct you in the right way, which then is a blessing to your family as you lead them well and they fear God and follow his ways. You see the blessings and success there, unlike a lot of families that are around you. You can be a beacon of light in your neighborhood, in your little pocket of this community that, hey, I want the peace that they have at that house. Like, I want the love and the joy that they have. And you can point to this is how we do it. This is how it works. This is how this works. And then we can, again, spread the ripple effect on into our nation and then to generations beyond us. This is the kind of life that God wants for us, that he wants to lead us in. And so as we fear him and follow his ways, we can find this truly successful, amazing kind of life and existence that affects us and others for God's glory.